Okay, so we're now on the record. Greetings to everyone. Kenna has a new, a new look, I see. Yes, thank you. It's from this uh, artist on Twitter. Markovka? I, I think so. Uh -huh. If you want to make one for yourself, I can find the link. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> is that supposed to be you or is that just a, a, a generalized yeah, representation? It looks like me. Here, that's wait, it. actually, I can do a reveal now that I have spitting image of what you Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, either one is fine with me. Um, so that's good. All right, so Becca's with us. Greetings. And slowly but surely we are gathering. Okay, I'll give it another 30 seconds or so. I still need to, to get my Jinyi, you're with us now. Thank you. Hello there. Um, okay, well, yeah. Okay, well, I guess, and Mar Marcia, good. Okay, I guess we're, we're ready to roll. Um, so what, what is today? Anyone? St. Patrick's Day? Yes, St. Patrick's Day. So today- Oh my God, I'm not wearing green. <laughs> I am, I am. My t-shirt du jour, unfortunately, it has no, it's the best I could do for a green, for something green. And it's not Kelly green, but it's, it's green. I hope it's green enough for, uh, for the uh, occasion. What I'm missing, of course, is uh, something much more uh, ostentatious, but I will, uh, we will get there in a second. Um, there we go. St. Patrick's Day in honor of the day, All right? And if you look, obviously, if you look for images on the internet, you'll find leprechauns galore and and uh, clovers and so forth, but and that's what my T-shirt should have. So now I need to remember to order a T-shirt for next year that has all of the appropriate uh, accoutrement for the day. But this led me to think that perhaps I can enlighten you a bit on uh, some matters of etymology and <clears throat> uh, some facts about Irish that actually are interesting, I think, uh, but and tie into our discussion from the other day about loan words and sound change. You know, you could, you know, that I'm not going to let a, an opportunity like this pass without turning it into a linguistic lesson. Um, so, where does Patrick come from? It comes from a, a, a Latin proper name, Patricius, that was that was borrowed into Irish. And interestingly, and this is where the the, the link with sound change uh, comes into play. Interestingly, it was borrowed in the oldest layer of Old Irish. It was borrowed as Cothreg. Uh, with a with a c a k in the initial uh, position, not a not a, a p, and that's because prehistorically, um, prior to the first the earliest records that we have of, of old Irish, which is from about the fifth through fifth century, sixth century, um, <clears throat> there was a sound change that eliminated a p in Indo-European p in all environments. So no p's remained in uh, Irish after this uh, sound change. We see this, for instance, in the word for father, which has a, a P or, or an F in all of the Indo-European languages, except for, uh, it, uh, well, not exactly. Uh, uh, Armenian is, 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 uh, has a special case, is a special case in that regard. But uh, Irish lo loses the, the consonant, initial consonant altogether, and ends up, it ends up as author for father. No P, no F, uh, no uh, labial-like sound at all <clears throat> in that word. And you can compare Latin pater, where the, uh, which has the P intact. <clears throat> now the, and what this means is that the, the non-Irish P uh, in patricius was identified with a K and, uh, and, came, and was uh, turned into a K in the borrowing process. Uh, that might seem like a strange sound change because P and K are at opposite ends of the mouth, the P at the lips and the K way back in the, in the velar area. But it turns out that P and K actually have some similarities in terms of their acoustics. There, so there's a sound similarity uh, that, so that if, if you're not dealing with writing, if you're not thinking about the, the way the sounds are pronounced, but if you're just going on, on listening and a lot of loan words, particularly in ancient times, 
were a matter of hearing a word and then trying to reproduce it <clears throat> rather than actually seeing a word written uh, or uh, and reproducing it uh, from a from a written form. So that the acoustic similarity of P and K is what, in the absence of any P sound in the language itself, led Irish speakers in this early phase to identify the P of Patricius with a, an Irish K, and it came out as Cothreg. Now, um, there's more to the story than that because we haven't yet gotten to, to that most Irish of all Irish names, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> And we, we could, these are a couple more examples of non-Irish P's being identified with a K sound. So pluma, I'm using the squiggly arrow to indicate borrowing as opposed to develops into. Um, so pluma was borrowed and uh, came out in Irish as plum. A purpura, the word for purple, <coughs> uh, was borrowed into Irish and came out as corkor, where both of the, both of the P's were, were identified as a K sound. But to get finally to get back to Patrick, it was later reborrowed, borrowed again into into Irish, <clears throat> after a time when the there had been a uh, greater degree of familiarity with Latin. It was it was a more it was taught in uh, in schools. It was used in the church and so forth. So that Latin was a more familiar language, and the P of Latin was not as alien as it had been in this early stage. So in this later stage of of Irish. The word was borrowed again. The name was borrowed again as Patrick, and that's where the Patrick that we know and love as an Irish uh, name uh, comes from. So it is ultimately from Latin Patricius, but it has this sort of more complicated history of two different layers of, of borrowing. And I don't think that that Saint uh, Cothreg's Day would uh, have quite the same uh, uh, feel to us uh, in America as uh, Saint Patrick's Day. Apparently, St. Patrick's Day is not a big deal to the Irish. It's more an Irish-American invention than anything else. Um, but, uh, and as long as we're talking about Irish, I thought I would uh, give you the etymology of my own name, Brian. Even though I'm Jewish by, uh, by heritage and, and upbringing, um, I, I have an Irish first name in Brian. And that comes from a Celtic word, Celtic being the subgroup of Indo-European that Irish belongs to. It comes from a Celtic form, brigant, which means high or noble. So of course, I, it's an etymology that I approve of. Um, we can compare uh, for the, the uh, notion of high, the, the brig part is the root here, uh, the Germanic word borg, meaning citadel, that is a high point, a fortified high point uh, that shows up in, um, in Old English in, in uh, the word borg or burg which survives in modern English only in place names. So uh, these are two that, I, that are, are from Ohio, uh, Bluingburg and Centerburg. I don't know if anyone, uh, any of you are from anywhere near uh, those. I think one of them is Fayette County, the other is Knox County. I don't know if that's, if that's uh, your part of Ohio, uh, but it also appears in, <coughs> excuse me, it also appears in uh, British uh, names like uh, Glastonbury, where the Bury is the, uh, is another, uh, actually, it's probably the regular sound change development from uh, from earlier English Borg, like that. So all of that uh, occasioned by uh, by St. Patrick's Day, and I think uh, I think there are important lessons to be learned there. So um, anyone, any of you wearing green? Uh, I don't I don't see I don't see much green. Supposedly, I can't do it because of, of COVID, but uh, when I was growing up, if you weren't wearing green on, on St. Patrick's Day, we were, you were allowed to pinch someone. So, uh, so uh, I hereby uh, socially distancingly pinch you all for not wearing green. I'm wearing green earrings, does that count? Mm, okay, I'll give you, I, I, I'll, I'll take away the pinch. All right. You're... Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Good. Okay, so. Um, any any questions about anything, either about, about Patrick or linguistics or a combination thereof? Okay, so let's move let's uh, move back to um, uh, our discussion at the end of or most of yet most of the, the end of uh, class last time and what you were working on for your for the homework, both the one that you did for Monday and the one that you did for today, the, the metaphor one, which we will look into and uh, look at in a little more detail uh, coming up is, um, 
uh, or instances of, of semantic change. And I put semantics in quotes because um, of the, the position I, that I took the other day saying that um, it's not the meanings that change, it's the association between a form and its meaning. That's, that's what changes. The meanings are available in a certain sense and it's a matter of attaching them to, uh, or sort of reattaching the, uh, the form to particular units of, of meaning that, that's involved. However, we can loosely refer to it as semantic change. It's a, a fairly, <clears throat> um, as long as we understand that, 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 that position, I think it's, it's a, a very convenient label. And speaking of labeling, what we do a lot in semantic change, if you read the chapter in the textbook, you'll see that a lot of it was, was uh, simply uh, classifying, saying, well, we have a change of this sort, of, of this sort, of this sort. You saw that in the, in the, previous, uh, in the previous class in the, in the homework assignment that you did for Monday, in that um, the, uh, the changes could be labeled as narrowing, Many of the examples on the homework were, were uh, narrowing, like from uh, uh, Sterban to die in, uh, or, or, or Olinger, sorry, Sterban to, to die in uh, general, to starve, die in a particular way. Um, uh, so there were several examples of, of narrowing. There were uh, broadening, we saw an example of with, uh, with uh, uh, thing uh, going from a, a very restricted judicial, more or less judicial context to this very broad sense of, of any, uh, any entity uh, whatsoever. Uh, pejoration, a number of, of you, uh, here's an example with um, uh, Nave, which is now a, maybe, maybe it's a bit archaic even now, but uh, something like a, a ne'er-do-well or a rogue, where earlier it was just a neutral term for a, a young man. And several of you um, uh, talked about some of the uh, instances in on the homework assignment in terms of, of, of pejoration. And some of you use the term pe pejorization, which I, I think is used, uh, is found uh, in various sources. I think in, in our textbook, we used um, pejoration, but um, different strokes for different folks, I guess, uh, as we see here. Um, and so, and, and, and it's one thing to label the changes, and it's important because it gives you a sense of, of, of what's going on, but the, um, the um, more uh, uh, telling question, I think, is uh, is how do we explain how they how they happen? How do how do these things occur at, at all? Um, and there, the uh, the importance of uh, context was what I I wanted to to focus on, and what we began to do at the end of class uh, last time, um, where context can be both the linguistic context and also the social or external context in which the uh, communicative acts that we refer to as language uh, take place. Some people have proposed a distinction, uh, and I think it's a useful terminological distinction between context referring to just the linguistic context and milieu at referring to the uh, social or the external context. Um, but that isn't, that isn't a widely uh, uh, used uh, distinction. The, the distinction is recognized, but the terminology is, uh, isn't. As long as we understand that, that context can have both this very broad sense and a very narrow sense, um, uh, depending on its context of use, then we can, uh, we can uh, work with that. And I think I left you last time with the example of uh, dust as a, uh, a, a synchronic verb in still a present in present day English where we have uh, opposite meanings depending on the context or the milieu, depending on the linguistic context of the particular object or the external milieu of exactly what action uh, you're doing. So if you are uh, dusting crops, you're putting uh, a, um, uh, uh, a um, I can't quite uh, come up with the right term, but a uh, a a uh, you're dusting you're 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 putting down a dust that that uh, prevents uh, damage from uh, from insects. So you're putting some you're putting the dust down onto the uh, plants, whereas with uh, dusting a table, the dust is on the table, and by dusting you are taking it off. So in either in either case, you're you're in a sense doing uh, something. Um, you might say this is due 
uh, something prototypical for the uh, context and in the context of flying over a, a field and trying to uh, do something with regard to dust and insect damage, obviously removing the uh, individual bits of dust is is not very uh, not very practical. Nor would it achieve what you wanted to, want to achieve. So the prototypical kind of activity would be putting something down onto the plants. Whereas since dust accumulates so readily, uh, you you have a, a surface like a table, and there's dust there. What is the prototypical thing that you would do? It would be to wipe the uh, the dust off of that. So there's a common thread here of doing something prototypical for the particular context or milieu to use the, that term but the um and the way it then gets realized is uh with regard to these uh uh different um different uh, actual activities that, that are involved that are that are from a practical or uh or uh uh, uh practice from a, yeah i guess that's enough from a practical point of view we see um in terms of opposites, we can look at uh, the word uh, black, where the the BL part at the beginning is was originally associated with uh, with white, actually. So so with an opposite, and uh, there there was in Middle English a word black meaning pale, and in Old Norse even the word for white or blonde hair. Lots of blonde uh, people in in Scandinavia uh, was uh, blacker. And the context here is, I think, the absence of real color. So, with both black and white, the common thread is that there, there aren't the the chromes or hues, however you want to characterize it, that 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 um, uh, to speak metaphorically, that give color to the uh, object that you're looking at uh, or or assessing or evaluating. Um, so, the the common thread is the absence of real color, but it's, it can be realized in opposite ways depending on uh, are you focusing on the, the uh, from the from the point of view of physics, from the uh, uh, sort of merging of all the different uh, light uh, or, or parts of the spectrum, uh, or that gives you white, if I remember right, but um, or removing them all together, which gives you uh, black. <clears throat> so we can make sense of some of these uh, shifts in meaning in terms of looking at uh, context or milieu. A really famous one in that regard is the word bead, which nowadays refers to a small, usually round object of some sort, usually glass or ceramic or, or the sort, um, but originally meant prayer. And in fact, was is cognate with the uh, German word uh, abeta, meaning prayer, and is related to the English word bid, even meaning uh, to, uh, to ask someone for something. But bead, um, in its original sense of, of prayer, uh, shifted to become this small round uh, uh, object, uh, let's say glass object. Uh, and what is the context? What is the, so the social or external milieu for this shift? Does anyone have an idea here? What is the, what is the realm of uh, Rosary? Uh, semantic realm? I'm sorry? A rosary? Rosaries, right. So within the, the semantic, I'm sorry, within the uh, 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 pragmatic realm of religion and religious practices, rosaries are, uh, are, were used to count out uh, the prayers that you were, that you were um, uh, 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 saying uh, to yourself or saying aloud. And so the practice of counting one's uh, beads was literally counting one's prayers, but it's achieved in the, uh, in this, in the um, Catholic context uh, of, it's achieved by counting out, uh, physically counting out the little small uh, uh, glass or ceramic objects on a, on a string. So counting one's prayers, counting one's beads, that is bead equals prayer, was physically equated with counting one's um, uh, physical, uh, round uh, object beads, and so we get this uh, shift of meaning. This is, <clears throat> this one is, is, I think, is really dramatic because with some of them you could say, well, they're in the same semantic sphere, like um, uh, black and white are both colors, or uh, 
or um, uh, what, did, what were some of our examples on the uh, homework assignment, like uh, a deer and uh, deer the animal and deer any animal are both in the realm of, of uh, the animal kingdom, uh, corn meaning a specific kind of grain and corn meaning grain in general is both something that's grown in nature, but bead a small round glass object and bead the abstract uh, entity, the abstract notion of prayer are pretty, pretty dramatically different from one another just on the face of it, but they have this common thread, this common element in the, um, in the context, the milieu of religious uh, practices, of the religious practice of counting, of saying prayers and counting out the prayers as you, as you say them. So here the, the milieu, uh, the religious milieu, uh, really provides an answer to what would otherwise just on a purely linguistic grounds be quite uh, quite puzzling in terms of a semantic uh, uh, a shift of the association that we would call a semantic shift. <clears throat> Another type of um, change in the external uh, context uh, has to do with technology. So we use the verb uh, sail to uh, sail across the ocean. Uh, a steamship can sail across the ocean. Now, even if there's no, there are no physical sails uh, involved, those wind power is not how you, uh, how you cross the ocean. It's still possible to do that. And occasionally you read in the newspaper, someone who built his own boat and sailed from California to Hawaii or, or something of, of that sort. But mostly uh, sail is just used as in a generalized term, a generalized sense of something that uh, steamships do crossing the ocean without the specific link to the uh, technology of, of uh, using sails and wind power. <clears throat> Similarly, um, a Teamster in the sense of a truck driver, the Teamster has been generalized because of the, uh, the Teamsters Union, it's been generalized to a, a whole range of, of occupations beyond just driving trucks. But originally it was a driver of a team of horses so that it was literally someone who was a, a stir as an agent noun suffix. So someone associated with a team, with a team of horses. We don't think of trucks as being a team. We don't think of, of um, the engine or the motor of a, of a truck as being a, uh, a, a team, even though we do talk about horsepower, right? We talk about such and such an engine has 150 horsepower or 400 horsepower or, or whatever. Um, uh, so so the, there's still some association there, but we don't use the uh, the, the team part of Teamster in the sense of truck driver is, uh, is divorced from the original sense of a team of, of horses. <clears throat> um, similarly, uh, right uh, originally meant to scratch. And if, we, if you think back, to, and I think we make this point in the, in the, uh, uh, the Hawk and Joseph textbook when we talk about runes, but if you remember what I uh, showed you Two weeks ago, I think the T-shirt about the runes, and we talked about the the ways and the way in which the runes were made was typically a uh, cut across the grain of the wood, so that it actually made a, dis a distinctive mark, and and that and that act of of writing was really an act of scratching the uh, the wood. Uh, so you can see how what the the association. So in the technological sphere of of um, actually producing writing by scratching on a, on, across the grain of a piece of wood, that this uh, relationship between write and scratch makes sense. Nowadays, we bang away at our computers and we're writing uh, and it's, there's, there's no scratching uh, uh, involved. So the, the meaning, the, this, the act of producing uh, symbols that give a visual representation of language is still is still there, but the but it's divorced from the actual uh, from the etymological sense of scratching uh, on a on a piece of wood. <clears throat> so um, I think it's important to keep in mind then that we have that, and we saw that with the broadening and narrowing in particular, the pejoration and elevation or amelioration of of certain uh, of the meanings of certain words. We can see these uh, conflicting directionality of, of change uh, in meaning uh, where it seems to, uh, 
to be associated with uh, conflicting contexts or conflicting milieu. Um, similarly, we see survivals in form, but shifts in a, the associated uh, meaning uh, going on here. And what it boils down to is there, there are a lot of highly uh, particularized shifts of meaning. And it's almost like we're talking about what happens on a word by word basis, which is somewhat different from what we were, um, <clears throat> what we were talking about with regard to sound change, where, uh, what is, what, is anyone, I, I know you all recall this, but I want someone to actually say, it. what was the sort of key feature of sound change uh, when we get right down to it? Anyone? What is what is what is the 90 percent, 90, 90 to ninety five percent right answer when I ask about sound change? It's regularity. Regularity. Thank you, Jenna. You were ready with the ready. Got with it this the, time. Uh, got it this time. You nailed it. Yes. Thank you. Right. So with with sound change, we talked in terms of of regularity, which which implied a, a certain degree of generality, that is generalization to all instances of a particular sound in a particular environment. But what we what seems to be the case with with change in meaning is that they're highly particularized, very specific to the context or milieu in which they occur, very specific kinds of associations that are that are drawn upon. By, uh, by and acted upon by speakers. So it's interesting to, to wonder, I don't know whether this idle thought occurs to any of you, but can semantic change be, be regular in the same sense that sound change is regular? What would it mean for a semantic change to be regular? I, I, I actually have an answer here, but I, want, I wonder if any of you can, can think of what the, <clears throat> what the analog in semantic change in the way that we've been describing it what would the analog to regularity of sound change be? Anyone, anyone want to take a stab at that? This is a case where you can't answer regularity of sound change because that's, that's what we're presupposing. So, so how, how could, what would it take to, to call uh, a class of semantic or a number of different semantic changes uh, how would you how would you be able to classify them as as regular in the same sense that that sound change is regular? Anyone want to venture a guess? All right, I'll reveal the answer to you. Yeah, so suppose I can give we, a thought. All right, go um, for it. I know we've already kind of proved it not to be true, but. Um, it could be like all words narrow as time passes. So, okay, so if, if if there's a single direction, so that all words go from from general to to specific, <clears throat> narrowing in their in their in their reference, that would be a kind of of uh, regular. So that anytime you have a word, word X, and you wait, you know, some period of time, word X is going to be narrowed in terms of its uh, its associations. We can. Yeah. We could probably come up with something that's maybe a little bit that's that's hard to judge because because if we're talking about all words doing that, then there as we said there are hundreds of thousands of words to worry about. But we could we could narrow our focus a bit to say so. What about all words in the same semantic sphere? Suppose we identify a semantic sphere. Do they all move in the same direction? Suppose all of the words that mean something like scratch, so etch, scrape, abrade, scratch. Suppose all of those took on this general meaning of, uh, I'm sorry, this associated meaning of, of to write, that is to produce visual, uh, a visual representation of language. Then we could say, well, there seems to be some, a semantic generalization about all of those words, but it doesn't, that seems not to have been the case. So <clears throat> while, uh, while scratch seems to have uh, taken on that, that uh, meaning in some of the Germanic uh, languages, Similar words like etch and scrape and so forth, or borrowings like a braid, seem not to have uh, undergone that meaning. So that would be that would be a strike against the idea of that semantic change is regular. Or suppose team took on a truck-related sense in the same way that teamster took on a truck-related sense. Or if, in the realm of colors, if pale, which means the absence of color, like the blue of uh, originally with black, suppose that came to pale came to mean dark. In addition, uh, or instead of meaning uh, uh, a, a light lightness in, in color, 
or thinking about thing, if all, this would be more like, this would be a, sort of along the lines of what you were suggesting, Kenna, uh, if all of the court or judicial related words broadened in the same way that thing broadened, uh, so that a lawyer wasn't just someone who appeared in court, but had a, a broader sense, or judge, well, maybe maybe judge has done done that in that uh, in that, <clears throat> or we could we could say that, you know, if we say, well, let you be, I'll, I'll let you be the judge of 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 that. It doesn't mean that you're a, a judge in a in a in a legal uh, court proceeding. You're just exercising a a certain degree of of evaluation or or uh, decision about something. But there, I think it's we we would have to worry about the historical directionality. Did judge originally mean this broad sense and has been specified to a particular legal uh, entity. I think that's actually what the, what the case is, or, or did it go in the opposite direction? I think, I think it's, um, it's that the, uh, the, the word has been uh, narrowed or restricted in its context to a particular uh, kind of, of, uh, of uh, evaluator, let's say decider. And so on. So you get the idea, I think. That, that's what regularity uh, with regard to semantic change could mean. And it doesn't seem like, like, like there's a lot of hope for this. However, there are a few such cases that are, that are, are interesting uh, to consider because they, they sort of uh, push the, uh, the uh, edges of, the, uh, of, of this uh, claim about, about semantic change. <clears throat> so uh, let me shift gears for a second I need to find another document but it has to do with <coughs> there are two examples and one has to do with cardinal directions in indo-european languages and the other has to do with certain religious terms in uh, zoroast in avestan which is a um, ancient iranian language associated with the zoroastrian uh, religion so let me find that material for ju in just a minute here um, Yeah, so here's the cardinal directions. This is taken from the, from the Hawk and Joseph textbook. You may have read it or not, as the case may be. Um, <clears throat> we start by pointing out that the, there are a number of different ways in which the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, uh, are realized in various Indo-European languages. <clears throat> um, a couple of major tendencies referring to the rising sun for east, and the, the setting sun uh, for west. Um, but the, the actual words that, that realize these, the actual notions that realize these are, uh, are, are quite uh, different across the different uh, languages. Uh, but there is a, an older, uh, what appears to be an older system that is operative in Sanskrit and Old Irish, okay, on St. Patrick's Day. We uh, have a nod in the direction of Old Irish. Um, in that where the orientation is strictly to the east, strictly uh, towards the, the rising sun. And in fact, orient comes from a Latin word that means uh, rising up or the verb is orior. <clears throat> so if you're, and in this, uh, in this system, you're oriented towards the east and that has the term uh, forward. So if you're facing east, you are face, you're facing forward. If you're facing forward, you're facing east. And once you're in that ori orientation, once you're in that uh, direction, then <clears throat> the other cardinal points, uh, so if you're facing east, then behind you or back, or the back part would be, uh, would be west. If you're facing east, the uh, right is uh, south and the left is north, right? You can all work that out in your, in your minds, I hope. Um, and, and we see this in, um, in uh, realized in Sanskrit, especially <clears throat> also Old Irish, but, but um, uh, we'll look at the, the Sanskrit because there's a comparison to be made with, uh, with Avestan, uh, which is very closely related to, to Sanskrit, as you may recall from that Indo-Iranian comparative problem that you did. Um, so in Sanskrit, the word for east is uh, this pranch literally means uh, facing forward. In fact, the PR of pranch is uh, cognate with the 
uh, F R of of four in English, so four word, and the anch actually is a, is a root meaning to bend, and uh, so it's bending forward in the same way that forward is uh, sort of turning forward, <clears throat> and then utara is the word for left, and that comes to mean uh, north. Uh, uh, dakshina is the word for right. It's actually cognate with English. Uh, the dexter of English dexterity, which means being able to do things well with your hands. And since most people are right-handed, the dexter meaning right and dexter meaning dexterous, uh, having abilities with your hands is, a, is a, uh, a reasonable association that we see there. So dakshina means right and uh, praticha means uh, behind, where the prati is, is a prefix meaning behind and the Believe it or not, this cha here is all that's left of the anch of, of, uh, of this root meaning uh, uh, to, uh, to bend. And Irish shows a similar, um, shows a similar uh, kind of uh, orient, um, system. Notice, by the way, the, uh, the, the P of the word pranch in Sanskrit uh, is there's nothing there in the, in the Irish, and that's another reflex of the P to zero sound change that took place between early Indo-European and, uh, and prehistoric uh, uh, Irish. Now, focusing on the Sanskrit system, <clears throat> it, it turns out that there's an interesting comparison to be made with, with another early Indo-European language, Avestan, uh, which you had on that uh, comparative uh, Indo-Iranian comparative exercise uh, a few weeks ago in that Avestan systematically shifted the system here by clockwise, that is to say, right words, by one point, so one click, as it were, uh, around the, the system, so that forward became uh, south. So, if you, so you're facing forward, and then you, you turn this way, uh, uh, you are you are then facing south. So so it's as if if you orient yourself completely, uh, turned one click so that forwards is south. Then these other uh, these other uh, meanings sort of fall into into place. So that forward became south, behind became north because it would be behind you, and uh, and right uh, became west because that would be where your your right hand uh, would be. So. This, this is a set of, of sort of not tightly connected uh, words and meanings so that it, <clears throat> if one changes, there was kind of a ripple effect in the others. And, and in that sense, we have a kind of, of, um, of uh, regularity to this semantic change. Move everything one click on the, in terms of the cardinal directions, in terms of a compass, if you will, and, and you, you get the, uh, the results. So that, that that would be something that, that sort of qualifies as, as uh, a regular semantic uh, change. Avestan compared to Sanskrit gives us yet another uh, example like that. Um, yeah, here, I'm sorry, here are the Avestan words. Uh, power are directed forward literally, but meaning uh, south and, uh, and so forth. Um, things get the, oh wait, we have a question here. How do I get to that? Ah, festive. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Isabel. That was from a that was from uh, my St. Patrick's picture, I think, earlier. Okay, it just showed up on my screen now. Um, <clears throat> I don't think the Avestan is particularly festive. Um, uh, but we find in uh, yeah. So so again, th this is this is from an earlier sheet. But what could regularity of, sem of semantic change mean? We've already uh, discussed that. But um, here's a poss another possible example from Indo-Iranian. Avestan, as I mentioned, is the sacred language of Zoroastrianism. And Sanskrit is the sacred lang language of Hinduism. There, there are parallels in their religious terminology that suggest common uh, cultural roots and, uh, from a religious standpoint. This has often been referred to as the old Vedic religion, referring to the to the religious practices as spelled out in the uh, Rig Veda, the uh, oldest uh, Sanskrit that we have and from about 1200 BC or so. And 
uh, really a collection of, of religiously oriented prayers and, uh, and statements and ritual practices and such. So we can talk about proto-Indo-Iranian culture and the, and the associated religion for that. And we find these, um, <clears throat> these, this common uh, religious terminology. So uh, Aryaman uh, and Aryaman, uh, Avestan in Sanskrit, meaning uh, member of a, of a religious uh, group, a religious sodality. Uh, uh, the fire priest, the Atharvan in Sanskrit, the Atharvan or Atharvan in uh, Avestan. They're uh, ritually prepared intoxicating drink. It was actually a, a hallucinogenic drink, maybe made from, uh, from a, um, a potion uh, made uh, from a hallucinogenic mushroom. Uh, called Soma in uh, Sanskrit and Hauma in Avestan. And here the, the, the differences in form are, reflect the regular sound changes that, that, uh, that differentiated Avestan from Sanskrit on the, from Proto-Indo-Iranian to the individual languages, some of which you saw in, the, uh, in that uh, homework exercise, like the, the T becoming a th next to an R in Avestan. You may remember that one. The word for sacrifice itself and the word for sacrificing priest are also uh, cognate forms. But interestingly, there's a class of words in which there are semantic reversals. So the Avestan word Ahura uh, is the word for God. In fact, the chief God of, of Zoroastrianism is Ahura Mazda, the, the uh, God Mazda. And the Sanskrit uh, parallel to that is Asura. Notice that the sound correspondences are there. Notice the, just like the H, and S correspondence in the word for soma, we have H and S corresponding in this word. But in Avesta, in Avesta, the word means God, but in Sanskrit, the word means a demon, so the opposite of a god. <clears throat> Similarly, and maybe perhaps confusingly, the <clears throat> Sanskrit word for God, which is deva, and is actually related to the Latin word that gave us deity in, in English, <clears throat> it, uh, the Avestan parallel uh, cognate form is daiva, and daiva means a demon, whereas in Sanskrit it means a god. So there's so ahura, asura, daiva, deva have a complete uh, exchange, as it were, a complete reversal, both of them. Similarly, Indra, who is one of the chief gods of the uh, Sanskrit pantheon, <coughs> has a parallel in Avestan, Indra, but it's the name of an evil spirit in Avestan. Similarly, Nasatya, the name of, of gods in, uh, in Sanskrit, uh, corresponds to Nanghaitya, uh, which is, but in the Avestan, it's the name of an evil spirit. So there's been there these reversals of the polarity, if you will, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of these words for gods and, and spirits and, and demons. So we can generalize over these four examples uh, so that anything that's minus human, but considered to be animate. So the gods and spirits are considered to be animate, but they are minus human. They're not humans like, like us. Whereas the priests, fire priest and the sacrificing priest are humans, are animate and human. So that's what I mean here by saying anything that's non-human, uh, animate, but non-human. Um, and, and if we assign a, a variable alpha, which could be either plus or minus, to the, uh, to the quality that is good or not good. And if that changes, uh, what we see here is actually in each one of these, it changes uh, to minus alpha good. So if, if alpha, um, if, if, oh, I don't think I can write on this. Um, hang on a sec. So if, if uh, alpha is plus, so, uh, so alpha, no. all right, aye, aye. this is all going crazy on me. I better not get too fancy, but okay. So, so if we're using this alpha to mean either plus or minus, and then we negate it, a minus of a minus, our mathematician Oscar will tell us is a, is a what? Minus of a minus, negative of a negative. Is positive. <laughs> positive, right? And a negative of a positive, so minus plus is a negative, right? I think that's basic, like 10th grade math or something. Um, so that 
The change in meaning was going from alpha, that these are either plus or minus, to the reverse of that, either minus or, or plus. And this would then be a generalization that would apply to all of these animate non-human entities in the religious sphere. And in that sense, it would be a kind of regularity of, of semantic change. And this one has an, has an, so you all, you all see that? You all see how that would be uh, the, the, an equivalent situation to regularity of sound change. We've specified it, we've gotten the context down very, very uh, narrowly. And within that narrow context, all of the candidate forms undergo this change, hence regularity. But this is an unusual circumstance. The one, and, and notice how we had to really <laughs> uh, struggle a bit to find an example uh, like this, whereas with regularity of sound change, it's all over the place. And this actually has an explanation that goes back to <clears throat> matters of, um, of uh, religious, the religious milieu in which these languages uh, uh, existed. So Zoroastrianism was a, a new religion that took hold on the Iranian side of, of things. And it represented a rejection and an overthrowing of the inherited traditional religion, what I referred to earlier as the Vedic religion. Some of the gods and practices were kept, but they were adapted to this new circumstance. It's kind of like the Protestant revolution in, in medieval Europe, uh, uh, rebelling against the excesses of the Catholic church and sort of a, re a reversal or an upheaval of the traditional religious order. Not exactly parallel, but, but it's kind of like that. Because um, <clears throat> I, I know that, that, that Zoroastrianism is probably something uh, new uh, to many of you. So I'm trying to contextualize it uh, somewhat. Um, and so it's been, it's been suggested that in this rejection and overthrowing in this upheaval of the inherited and traditional Vedic religion, bad became good and good became bad. Basically, if you're, if you're turning everything upside down, then the, po the polarity, the, the, quali the, the qualities that, that, that these entities have will be turned upside down. So there's a, so even here with uh, regularity, with, with this small instance of regularity of semantic change, we have an example of, uh, of the uh, context, the milieu, in this case, the religious milieu mattering, making a difference, uh, dri driving really the, the uh, semantic uh, change. And it turns out that there actually are some exceptions. So, <coughs> so it, I, I, I sort of stacked the deck by giving you the four good examples first, but there are four less uh, good examples. Uh, the grandson of the waters, Apamnapat, is a divinity in both of the, uh, both of the uh, religions. Um, Mithra is the name of the divinity in both uh, Vivahant and, 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 so, and Yama and so forth. Now, was there a, a different generalization involving them? Maybe they were more human, uh, after all, grandson, uh, Yama as the son, Vivas, Vivasvant as a father figure. Maybe they were more human and therefore not subject to this non-human animate reversal rule. Or maybe it's just, we need to give up on this idea of regularity of semantic change. It would be fine with me if we did. I think, I think regularity of sound change is such a, such a cool notion. And it's fine with me if it's particular to, uh, it's a, if it's a property just of sound change. But we might want to, as I say, since we see, we observe it in sound change, we might want to at least consider whether other kinds of change show that. It will turn out when we look, when we go to, uh, when we turn next week to morphological change, we'll see that, that this question of regularity comes up again uh, and, and serves as a very useful way of distinguishing uh, morphological change from sound change. So it's a question that we need to keep uh, on our minds. Okay. Um, so everyone okay with that? Did that, all, did that all go down reasonably well? Okay, good. Um, let's then turn to um, let's see what time it is. Um, okay, we have about half an hour. I'm, I'm going to uh, give you a chance to have a break from from me. Uh, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms for. Uh, about 10 minutes and I'll have you, um, let me stop sharing here. I'm gonna, uh, I'm, 
this is sort of moving us in the direction of, of the, um, the metaphor uh, uh, exercise that you did for today, which you all did very well on, by the way. I, uh, I, was, I really enjoyed reading them, um, reading your comments on that. I'm gonna put something in the chat here that uh, I hope, I expect is gonna to go to everyone. Um, that's week nine, we want week 10. Okay, so there I put I put this in your in your um, in your chat. All of you you should all download this now because when we go into the breakout rooms, you might not have access to it. And it's just a silly cartoon from the Sunday comics. Um, but uh, I think when you when you uh, when you read it, you'll see why I'm having you uh, consider it. Um, read it read it through collectively, and you know the, the, you'll be in groups of I guess there there are thirteen of you. I'll put you in groups of of I'll put you in three different groups. Uh, so there'll be four of you, um, maybe five in one of them. Um, and uh, read, read through it and see if there's anything that you understand in it. Um, and uh, and uh, that's, there are, lots of, there are lots of idiomatic phrases in here that uh, I suspect you will not understand at all. And it has every, and it has nothing to do with context and everything to do with age. So we'll, we'll see what you think. Okay, so you all have downloaded that. I'm gonna put you in, uh, in breakout rooms, three different breakout rooms. This is just for a change of pace, um, but to give you a chance to interact uh, with one another. You'll can be you assigned- screen sharing? I'm, I'm sorry? Sorry, can you enable screen sharing? Oh, sure, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. You, oh, you asked me about that before. Um, all participants can screen share now. Good, thank you. That's that's an important point. So you'll be in in these three different breakout rooms. Just discuss, read it, read the the comic, discuss it amongst yourselves for like ten minutes, and we'll reconvene in at twelve twelve. Okay, and go from there. So enjoy. <clears throat> All right, good. All right, excellent, good, good, good.
Okay. <coughs> Three, two, one. You should all be back. Back in now. Back in the fold. Yes. Good. Okay. So, um, how did you do with this? Let me let me um, find it here. Yeah, so here was this uh, cartoon, kind of silly cartoon, of course, but uh, let me blow it up a bit. <laughs> How did you do in terms of making making sense of this? They, Were there any... My colleagues, they had to explain everything. Right, so for non, I, when I've done this before, <laughs> non-native speakers of English, uh, <laughs> are just completely baffled. Uh, it, it's it's totally, uh, totally <laughs> opaque. The meaning isn't there at all. But uh, how about, the, were the native speakers of English, were you able to, to understand what's going on? How many of these were, were, were phrases, terms, words that you've heard before? Were there any that, the, that, that you hadn't heard? Between the four of us in our group, they were all something that at least one person had heard before. Okay, but that means that, that at least at least one person had not heard them. Uh, right. <laughs> also, yeah. Okay, so there's, <clears throat> I think that's an important point to, to realize that there can be a lot of individual variation in terms of <clears throat> experience with particular words and particular um, uh, phrases in terms of, uh, you know, they might be things that you're, how many of you sense that there was a, a an age uh, distinction here. How many of you, for instance, might have heard your grandparents saying some of these, or old fogies like me saying some of these things? I don't actually use many of these, but I guess some of them I do. Um, pill. So she was. He could. She could be a real pill sometimes. That's a, a word I still use in that sense. Um, some of them I think are pretty common. Like took everything but the kitchen sink. That that one. That my sense is that that one is pretty uh, in pretty widespread use. Uh, to wake up and smell the roses, I, I think I I still use that one. But um, living the life of Riley, I just remember that from a, a TV show in the 1950s when I was growing up called The Life of Riley, and it was based on this character named Riley who all sorts of things went well in his life. <clears throat> um, don't take any wooden nickels. I think I associate that more with um, with movies from the 1930s. See in the funny papers, I I've, I guess maybe early you know 1930s or so films, but uh, not something I've I've actually ever heard anyone say. Um, any other, did anyone else have any reactions to these? Uh, did all, did all of the groups have all of your groups have the same more or less the same reaction that that some of them okay, I understand, but others, uh, you, had to, you needed to puzzle a bit over them. Does anyone use the term skedaddle anymore? Probably can... white suburban dads. Okay. <laughs> so there's, a, there's, a, there's social dimensions to this, to this usage. Again, that's an important point about uh, variation in, uh, in language. It's not just a matter of what you know, but also uh, sort of who you are, and um, uh, in in using some of these terms. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a member of our group say um, they also heard "smelled the coffee," "wake up and smell the coffee," and "smell the coffee." Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I think I've heard that one too. Um, okay. Um, any any other reactions? This was meant to this was meant just to be a bit of a lighthearted diversion, but it makes an important point about the um about the extent of uh of knowledge so i mean if there really are hundreds of thousands of words in the language it's unrealistic to expect that that every speaker would know all let's say let's say 200,000 words that every speaker would know all 200,000 words and some of the words are very specialized in terms of their domain of usage specialized i mean so there's linguistic terminology like morphophonemic that I know and maybe some of you have run into, but I bet if you try it out on your roommates, unless your roommate happens to be a linguist, 
uh, they will look at you with a blank look and say, what on earth are you talking about? Um, <clears throat> So, so there are there, and, and that's just the way of the world that, that there would be uh, specialized ways of talking about uh, particular objects that matter for your specialty, uh, whether you're a, a wood carver or a or a sailor or a uh, or a linguist uh, or a biologist or a musician or whatever. There would be certain technical terms, <clears throat> um, and sometimes technical terms can be used in different ways. Uh, in general usage versus uh, um, technical usage. So the word velocity in, um, uh, for a physicist means not just speed, but also speed in a particular direction. Whereas velocity in common usage generally just means speed. So when, when a baseball announcer talks about the pitcher having great velocity on his fastball, he's not talking about the vectors that are involved in the in the uh, movement of the ball, he's just talking about how quickly it gets from the pitcher's hand to the to home plate, for instance. <clears throat> okay, good. So you get the point, I, I think, um, and we can move on. But does anyone have any last uh, last uh, comments on this? Okay, fair enough. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, go through. Uh, okay, that one we just covered. Uh, but I have moving in the direction of metaphors and change. We can uh, go through these slides here. This is moving in the direction of our of our uh, the homework assignment for today. <clears throat> so by metaphor, uh, it'll turn out I think, and some of you actually signaled this in your in your discussion about uh, some of the examples in the uh, happy and sad uh, homework assignment. Uh, that you did for Monday, but uh, you got you got a good taste of it in in what you did for today. But it, I think it's it I think it'll turn out that metaphor is really a very powerful device, a powerful mechanism for um, for language change, and it really involves. Uh, this is a sort of classic definition: a figure of speech in which <clears throat> a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is literally. It is not literally applicable. So it's extending the range of of uh, of referent uh, for a particular uh, uh, phrase. And uh, as I mentioned in the homework assignment, it really involves a um, a kind of uh, I use the term lichen, a kind of likening. That is, you you draw a relationship between two uh, entities, and you say, I'm going to interpret uh, this entity in terms of some other entity. It's a kind of, this is a term that'll come up uh, uh, later on, uh, but we've already had occasion to think about it uh, in class. It's a kind of analogical um, way of interpreting the world really, interpreting things, things in this broad sense. So it's a, a likening, which is to say an analogical, by an analogical here, I mean, you're drawing an analogy between two entities. You're likening one to the other, saying X is like Y along some particular uh, dimension. And that's really a kind of analogical uh, way of thinking, uh, way of interpreting things, or thinking about the world, you might say. <clears throat> um, so metaphor is there, therefore really a stretching and this is again, by using stretching here, we're, we're actually speaking metaphorically about metaphor, uh, but it's a stretching of the boundaries for the usual or typical usage for a word or a phrase. Now, some of you in your 10th grade English classes may have uh, uh, been exposed to a distinction between metaphor and simile. How many, is that something, does that ring a bell with any of you? Metaphor versus simile? I remember it from my from Mr. Maloney's tenth grade English class in when I was in high school. <clears throat> but um, a simile is a figure of speech involving the comparison of one thing with another of a different kind, used to make a description more emphatic or vivid. But what you sort of learn in tenth grade is that a simile involves the overt uh, comparison, so brave as a lion or crazy like a fox, whereas metaphor is more subtle. It does it's just this likening and you have to work out the the relationship 
uh, sort of for yourself, as it were. From a linguistic standpoint, I don't think it really matters a whole lot. Uh, so as I, as I say here, simile typically involves the use of like or as, <clears throat> whereas metaphor is just this more um, uh, direct application. So he is a lion as opposed to he is like a lion uh, would be the, the, the difference. But the um, um, for us, it, from a linguistic standpoint, the um, distinction is really irrelevant. What's crucial, as, as I tried to, to suggest in this, that homework assignment, is the likening of X to Y. You draw a like relationship between two entities. And that's really what's, what's critical. And, it's, and that's the way in which you are uh, <clears throat> sort of, as I say, stretching the boundaries of the usual or typical usage for a word or, or, or phrase. Um, we can also uh, keep in mind the notion of fresh versus stale or dead metaphors. Um, this is speaking metaphorically once again. Uh, what I wanted you to see from that uh, homework assignment was just how pervasive metaphor is in our, in our daily uh, usage. Um, and it's very hard uh, to uh, not to slip into metaphorical ways of talking about, about things. It's a very natural kind of uh, way, uh, as I suggested back here, a natural way of, of interpreting things or natural way of thinking about the world is really interpreting it in terms of something you already know. So you know what it means to stretch. So if we're talking about uh, uh, boundaries, physical boundaries, we say, we, you, you know what it means to stretch the physical boundaries. So we apply that to the notion of stretching these conceptual boundaries in talking about uh, metaphor. <clears throat> um, so some uh, there are we can think of fresh versus stale or fresh versus dead metaphors. The stale metaphor is it, it, it is defined as a metaphor which has lost its impact due to overuse. An example like the eye of a needle, uh, the likening of the little hole in, at the end of a, a needle to to an eye. Uh, I don't think. I don't think we really give it a second thought uh, when uh, we say, oh, eye of a needle, just like, just like the eyes in your, in your head, or the foot of a bed, just like the feet at the end of your, at the end of your legs. So that would be, those would be sort of uh, stale or dead metaphors, but in a way it does them an injustice to say they're stale or dead. They've just become ordinary meanings for uh, some of the words. And that's why I asked you on that homework assignment to think about, have any of these <clears throat> expressions become so uh, commonplace that they really don't have a an obvious metaphorical value to them. And some of you, and, and interestingly, some of you differed, said, well, you know, this one I think is still metaphorical, this one isn't, and, and you weren't all uniform in your, in your uh, reactions. We can go over some of those. Um, yeah, so another way of looking at dead metaphors is just that they've become entrenched as idioms or new meanings attached to a, a word or phrase. And this is a way in which the lexicon can be enriched, the, or the sort of vocabulary, the dictionary entry can be enriched and, and augmented. So some of the ones that, I've, that I found in, in poking around on the internet for dead metaphors was the spine of a book. Um, it, we, I think now we simply say, oh, it's this, it's, the, it's this part. This is my grammar of old Irish, by the way, uh, which I hold up proudly on St. Patrick's Day. Um, so this would be the, the spine of the book. It's what holds the book in place, right? It, 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 it's like the backbone of the book, literally. When we talk about, you know, if, if I had you write something extensive and I said, well, you know, uh, it, yes, your introductory paragraphs like this, but when you get into the body of the essay, well, again, that's likening the, the essay to, to the human uh, corpus, if you will. And, um, and but I think, I think it's just sort of ordinary usage. We talk about groundbreaking research. I, I, again, I think that it's a metaphor. It's like, you know, it's how you start out any, any new uh, building project, but the research doesn't, doesn't literally start with a shovel in, in the ground. Uh, another one said, life is no bed of roses is another, another dead metaphor. But as I said, I think dead and stale are kind of uh, unfortunate metaphors to use for this because they, they, they aren't, they're still very much alive as part of the language. They just have taken on a, a different, uh, uh, a different uh, quality uh, to them. Here's one fly off the handle, originally referring to an ax head flying off of an ax handle, but now it's just 
going out of control. So you can see also uh, what's at work here is a certain degree of, of generalizing, right? So fly off the handle had a very specific meaning referring to ax heads. And now it's, it's sort of divorced from the idea of fly off a handle, uh, fly off the, the, the uh, ax handle. Though if you did see an ax head fly off of the handle, you could maybe jokingly say, oh my God, look, he just flew off the handle or some sort of that, that, that tool just flew off the handle. <clears throat> But now it has a more general meaning of go out of control. So some of the, these uh, labels that we attached to, uh, to uh, our semantic, our instances of semantic change have, um, uh, um, uh, are, are applicable to what's going on in metaphor. And that suggests that maybe some of the broadening that we see is really a metaphorical broadening, uh, metaphorical likening that, uh, that led ultimately to the to a new association of a meaning to a particular uh, form. <clears throat> now, some of these are totally opaque. I don't know if, if you knew the history of brand new, but brand refers to a fire brand. So brand new was a piece of wood that was taken fresh from a fire. And so it was new, it was uh, newly, uh, uh, newly hot, like, like you know, uh, uh, still burning or, or in the stage where it was uh, a red or black or red coals. So this was, originally new like a firebrand is new. So brand new was, was new like a firebrand, a metaphorical uh, extension. And one of that we, that we had on the, uh, on the uh, homework assignment upset the apple cart, uh, you can see that it's one of you actually referred to these displays of fruit and how easy it would be to, uh, for, for the whole, the whole uh, thing to come crashing down if you just, if you picked out an apple from the bottom here, the whole, the whole thing would collapse. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and there it is. There's the apple cart that has been upset. Um, so uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, uh, maybe we could spend, let me actually see what time it is. I'm gonna get out of this. Um, stop sharing where, oh, we only have two minutes. So that's not really enough time to, <coughs> to uh, do anything on the uh, on the homework. I, I read your homeworks uh, and I, I I thought they were very enlightening. And as I said, I think you all, you all did a really good job. And so next time on next Monday, we'll spend a few minutes on on uh, going over the, those those metaphors. Um, so if you want to revisit them, if you want to think more about them, that's fine. But uh, that's not an official assignment or anything of that sort. And we will then on Monday take up the question of the semantics and of and what they, how they can be used or cannot or should not be used in dealing with uh, determining relatedness among, among languages. That, that will be in connection with the Campbell, uh, Greenberg and Matisoff uh, readings. And, the, and I hope you all saw that, that I uh, took Hannah's uh, comments to heart and gave you a, a reprieve on the homework assignment, those five questions I want you to consider for that. So good. Glad you appreciate it, um, and I and I'm glad you. I'm, I, I should say I was glad, Hannah, that you spoke up about that because even though I I shot you down at first, uh, it did make me think, and um, I like I like to to think that I'm flexible enough so that uh, I can I can adjust uh, as necessary. <laughs> yes, everyone owes Hannah a big thank you. So <laughs> good. Okay, so um, uh, it was good. Uh, chatting with you all again as usual and uh, I hope you have a good weekend. The weekend starts uh, on Wednesdays according to OSU official uh, official rules. So um, I hope hope you all have a good a good rest of your week and weekend and I will see you then on uh, on Monday. Okay. All right, take care everyone. Thank you. All right, see you. <clears throat>